Thank you very much for, uh, to SAGES and the program committee for uh, the opportunity to speak and to the moderators of this session. It's a, a wonderful honor to be up here. Um, we're supposed to leave this up for seven seconds, so at that time I'll also apologize for having to switch around the order because I have to run to a, um, uh, catch a flight right afterwards, but I'll keep a few minutes at the very end just to answer some questions. Um, I won't be discussing anything related to intuitive on this. So the probably more important caveat that I need to talk about before we get into quality measure measurement is that if you picked a single outcome, we're going to talk about outcomes, if you pick a single outcome, there's an incredible amount of heterogeneity within that outcome. And we know all of that clinically. These are completely different venous thromboembolisms and pulmonary, pulmonary embolisms, right? We would all much rather, if you're going to get, have to check that checkbox on a, the patient having a pulmonary embolism, we'd much rather have that sub segmental one on the right than that one on the left. Yet for most of our quality metrics, that just gets a check as a pulmonary embolism, even though they're very different things. The second is that there's an incredible amount of heterogeneity within the clinical presentation of a given diagnosis or presenting problem. Both of these are my patients. Both of them are umbilical hernias. They have the same ICD-9 codes. They are very different operations. They're going to come with very different outcomes, very different ways of having to measure quality. So in trying to figure out um, how I was going to structure this talk, and I'm thinking, wow, sprint or marathon, where do I go with this? I said, I know. I'm coming to Sages. I'm going to look to Sages. We have these wonderful guidelines. If people don't know about them, there's a website with a whole bunch of different guidelines to help guide us. And this is the Sages guideline for ventral hernia repair. And I said, well, what do they say is the most important? And the very first sentence says, the goal of ventral hernia repair is the relief of patient symptoms and our cure of the hernia, minimizing recurrence rates. So bummer. They said both. <laughs> you both have to deal with the patient's symptoms, which is going to be probably a short term, but also they made sure to throw in their recurrence rates. And as we all know, recurrence rate is more often a long-term problem. But the reality is that our world is dictated from forces outside of ourselves. And many of those are this alphabet soup that's out there that defines quality for us. Many of us come from hospitals that are part of ACS NISQIP. ACS NISQIP is based on 30-day outcomes. All of the outcomes um, in uh, the National Quality Forum outcome database, the overwhelming majority of those are short-term outcomes. NCQA, hospital accreditation. When we have to make decisions about um, treating SSIs, whether or not we diagnose this or that. That comes down to how our hospitals are graded. And our hospitals are very often graded on short-term outcomes. These are 30-day metrics. And so if we are looking to define quality from the organizations for the most part that are defining quality, and the notable exception, and I'm uh, sure uh, Ben could speak much more to this, is the AHSQC that does have some long-term outcomes built in. The overwhelming majority of the outcomes that are measured for us or that we're told to measure or the metrics that we are held to are all short-term outcomes. They are all what happened at the time of surgery. But that's okay because we're surgeons and we understand that there are both short and long-term consequences to what we do. So I'm sure that if we went to the literature, we would see that there's a lot of evidence and a lot of research that is pushing us to help us understand not only short-term but long-term outcomes. But the reality is that when I went to the literature to try and look for these long-term outcomes, the data around long-term outcomes are very, very sparse and essentially are in two fields. You're starting to see chronic pain papers, um, but for the most part, the only long-term outcome any really reports on um, in the literature is recurrence. That is contrasted with short-term outcomes, like your 30-day outcomes, that you see very routinely in all of the uh, uh, research manuscripts that are out there. But this is an important concept, whether or not short or long-term outcomes should be the uh, what we're focusing on, mainly because Worldwide inguinal hernia alone, this isn't even counting ventral hernia, 20 million procedures are performed, 800,000 in the United States. That's a shocking number. And the limited high quality studies that we do have about long term outcomes suggest 11% of patients suffer from a recurrence. And the only reason it's 11% is because that data tends to be a 10 year outcome. So on 10 year follow ups, 11%. And the problem is when you look at those curves, um, they often keep on going up. So what would it be if we looked at 20 year or 30 year? 
right? We all see patients that now had, oh, an inguinal hernia repair in their 20s and they're now in their 60s. What is the rate of that? And same with chronic pain, 10 to 12% are chronic pain. And this is one of the um, great studies that is out there. This comes out of the Shoulders Clinic in um, Canada and they put this together primarily, I don't know if I have a pointer on here, but you can see there's a low line down there. That's the Shoulders Clinic saying, hey, we're good at what we do and everybody else has struggle. But even them, there's a constantly increasing line um, of recurrence. The same is true when you look at chronic pain. Chronic pain tends to increase over time. And so I think we really need to start thinking of hernia disease as a chronic disease and we, start to, we have to measure those outcomes um, of, uh, in a chronic fashion. And so now I wanna flip this around and I, everybody I'm sure is either on their computer or on their phone. And I'd like you to um, log in, can we, um, you guys switch over for us. I'd like you to log in. I'm going to give you a scenario. So pull out your phone. What you have to do is you have to text ISQIC, I-S-Q-I-C, that's the quality collaborative I uh, help run, I-S-Q-I-C. You text those letters to the number 22333. So you send a text to 22333. When you do that, you'll get a reply that says, welcome to Jonas Stolberg's poll. And here's the scenario. So all of you sitting in the audience right now, you're all at stages, hopefully none of you have an inguinal hernia, but you get on the plane to go home and uh, you're starting to feel a little discomfort and you're like, wow, it's kind of awkward. You're shifting in your seat and you're sort of sore. And then you realize tonight, um, you know, you're in the shower and you say, you look down, you go, you gotta be kidding me. I have an inguinal hernia. So now I want you to think to yourself, if that happened to you, if you had to have a, uh, if you look down and you have an inguinal hernia tonight, what are you going to do? Are you going to say, I'll forget it. I know what an inguinal hernia is. I know my risks and benefits. I know my age. I'm not going to do anything. I'm not going to seek a surgeon. I'm um, just going to watch it. Maybe 10 years from now, it'll be bigger and then I'll want surgery. Or are you going to, um, you know, pick up the phone and uh, go find a surgeon and get your inguinal hernia fixed? And as I thought, it's kind of mixed. And not only that, that often if you ask that to a group of surgeons, most surgeons are like, I don't want my inguinal hernia fixed. It's just a little uncomfortable while I'm flying. I can live with it, right? Maybe let it get bigger. Maybe let it um, fester a little bit. That's uh, next slide, please. That's the reality of how most of us would treat ourselves, but it's often not the reality of how we treat our patients. Uh, next, um, I don't know how to switch the thing. Okay, so the next question then is, if you're going to get surgery, let's say it's either now or it's five years from now, it's 10 years from now, you need surgery, what type of hernia repair are you gonna want? And remember, you just have one-sided inguinal hernia. What are you going to want? And again, if you ask a bunch of SAGES uh, surgeons, They'll often say a minimally invasive repair, even though most of our guidelines say, oh, unilateral inguinal hernia. For the women in the room, there are some guidelines that say you still should do it minimally invasively. For the men in the room, I know a lot, all my partners would do it open. Uh, unilateral inguinal hernia and me, most of my partners would do open. So there's some variety. We all have different methods of doing it, but if we had to have surgery, some of us would have open, some of us have. And it shows the discrepancy in how we measure quality and, and what we find important. But the last question, next slide, is, is which do you think actually matters more? Most surgeons would tell you, I know exactly who would do my surgery. It's less about the technique, it's more about I know exactly who would do my surgery. Some know, some really know that they want a minimally invasive repair. So as we sit here, we have a whole hour to talk about quality, defining quality in hernia surgery, defining whether we need short-term, long-term. I'm trying to highlight the fact that we need to approach this question as if we were the patient. If we had the hernia and we need to know what we were doing next, and we would probably make our decision not necessarily based on all the data that we have in the literature. We'd make our decision based on other criteria that we don't currently have available. Can you switch back to my slides, please? So as we go forward and we think about ourselves as a physician helping to treat and bandage up that patient, we have this swirling pressures around us of all of these different groups that are measuring quality, they're dictating what quality is, but we're specifically in the middle of that swirl together with the patient and we have to be the advocates for the patient. We have to be the one that starts to define what quality perhaps should be in hernia repair. And so if we look back at that list of measurements, I now have a few extras that I've thrown on there that I think we need to do a lot more measuring of.
We need to measure these things. Return to work. How long does it take until someone returns to work? That might be a really big deal, especially financially for some people with the medical bills that are coming up. Or patient satisfaction. They're starting to measure it for us. Why aren't we measuring it ourselves? But a lot more development is, should go into these long-term outcomes. I can't tell you the number of patients that I see that come in that are all upset because they have numbness. They don't have a hernia anymore. But how many of us are really doing prophylactic iliolingual nerve uh, resections? Not too many, but there are a lot of people out there not coming to SAGES who are still doing it. A lot of folks get upset about their numbness. How about long-term infections? Who here does laparoscopic ventral hernia repairs, eye palms? Just show of hands. Okay, so a good number of people. Who here has taken care of a patient who had diverticulitis in a prior eye palm? That's hell. That's a horrible, horrible problem, right? But who here knows the data on how we treat that, how often the mesh itself gets infected, whether we should be taking it out, whether, right? We don't measure this. We don't have good studies that look at this. We're putting mesh in people who are in their 30s you know, they don't have diverticulosis right now, but we probably need to be thinking about what are the consequences of intra-abdominal mesh for someone who's obese, has a high likelihood of diverticulosis, perhaps diverticulitis, and now even a small episode of diverticulitis can be a really big problem. So things like this are questions that we need to start asking and go well beyond um, our 30-day outcome measures. So if we look to what I would consider critical questions that are important to patients, I think recurrence is still up there. We need much better data on long-term um, outcomes of recurrence, because as we saw, recurrence continues to go up. Inguinodynia, we had an excellent session on that. I hope people were able to uh, make that earlier. Um, some wonderful tips and tricks, but a lot of lot more uh, research needs to go into that. But there are also these things over on the right-hand side of the screen there, like delayed mesh complications, right? We all know of erosion and things like that, but the placement of our mesh, we should perhaps consider the other disease processes that are going on. What is the consequence of the tap and tap in a male who may have prostate problem 15 years later. Um, Patient-centered outcomes and how to measure that. And just real quickly in the very little time I have left, I want to talk just briefly about how I'm trying to approach some of these alternative measures that we're doing. I work for the last two years with a group called Health Loop that was recently bought by this group. I don't make money from them. There are lots of groups out there. You can use another one, but I'm using it as an example. They have what's called the Get Well Network and they're integrated now into uh, Northwestern. I track 100% of my patients. The first 100 um, robotic TARS that I did, I just sort of measured with this app, just like I measured everybody else. I could download the data in a matter of a couple minutes, I could see a daily pain score of the robotic TARS, and that's this group over here on the left. That's the kind of data that empowers us to then make decisions in real time. And I could find out all of those outcomes just in real time. I don't need to like wait for a publication to come out, and I, I can know it in my patients. That's the type of integrated um, approach to data collection that we need. But furthermore, once they have this and it's downloaded, I ask them functional quality of life questions out. You can see that six months, one year, and two years. I have an 81% response rate at two years for functional outcomes, 68% overall. Um, 426 patients um, have received that survey. And then here's the out, here are the data. I can just draw the curves, and, the, and it does it for me. So and using mobile health and other technologies to allow us to follow patients out six months, one year, two years, and hopefully annually for every year after that. And furthermore, I do a lot of research in opioid reduction practices, and I'm using it for pain interference scores and opioid use. Here's our opioid use tracker. Um, it was started uh, only about a year ago, so we don't have uh, one-year data yet. This is six-month data, pain interference scores. There's uh, a curve on the whole population. I can break it down by procedure and other things. And we've now built it into that particular product. So with the work of the American College of Surgeons, I worked on the module that I already built, gave it to what is now, I guess, the Get Well Loop network, and anyone who has that app can use that loop. They can know daily pain scores, and they can track over time. We're currently doing that for everyone who's actively using the loop, and in the last uh, five months, we've got 3,994 patients already enrolled. Um, and with that, I want to say thank you very much for the time and the privilege of the podium, and I answer a few questions before I have to run. Thank you.